Welcome to our panel discussion on diversity in data science education. My name is Dr. Talitha Washington, and I'm a professor of mathematics at Clark Atlanta University, and I'm also the director of the Atlanta University Center Data Science Initiative. I am joined with three amazing women on the panel who will talk to us tonight about, or today, depending on where you are, uh, diversity and data science education. And I'm just gonna jump right into the first question. Dr. Joe Boiler, first just tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, but tell, talk to us a little bit about your involvement in this new curriculum framework that's coming out of California, that's developing some new content standards. What will data science look like in K-12? And if you had to think about what will data science look like in, in K-12 moving forward, how would you envision that pathway? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say I'm thrilled to be here to start with an amazing conference. Uh, my name's Jo Bowler. I'm a professor of mathematics education and co-founder of ucubed.org, if you'd like to come and see more. It's really important that we bring data science into K-12 education. Our kids live in this data-filled world and it, they need to be developing data literacy just to live effectively as teenagers and as young people. So um, most of the country has a set of standards called the Common Core that were created in 2009. They're not updated for our current world. They don't really include data science. But here in California, um, I'm one of the writers of a new framework. And what we've been able to do in that framework is really uplift all the data that's inside the standards currently. There is quite a bit of data understanding inside those standards, but most schools ignore it, or and a lot of people have said, you don't need to pay attention to that. So we're really trying to make it a lot more important for teachers and schools. Going forward, though, we need a, a much bigger focus on data science K-12. We're doing the best we can with the standards that are written, but new standards need to come out. And we're working hard at our center and with others to really bring data science into K-12 education more centrally. It's very important for students and there's a really strong equity initiative that goes with that. But I'll talk about that a bit later, I think. Thank you. Dr. Karina Edmonds, you work at SAP at this intersection of data science and the tech business, and you have experience both on the business side and, and the education side. And we know that there are a lot of educational tools that are emerging from companies that are just really impressive and amazing. Can you talk to us a little bit about what sort of tools SAP has and how, are, is, how is SAP ensuring that these resources really are available to all sorts of institution types? Sure, first, um, thank you, Talitha. Thank you for having me on the panel. Um, very excited to be here. As you mentioned, I lead the academies and university alliance at SAP, and a big part of my job on the university alliances side is exactly that that you mentioned to make sure that um, our tools and our curriculum is available to uh, a, a wide range of students, a diverse set of students. Um, SAP itself um, is quite committed uh, to this initiative. In fact, even internally, we have Learning for Life, which ensures that. Um, which basically signals our commitment um, in the skilled workforce. And, and so whether it be from curriculum, we have an ERP sim game to expose students, but um, mostly through our curriculum. We offer classes, we offer training to faculty to teach our curriculum, both on the business side and on the engineering side um, for data science. And, and um, like I said, it's, as you know, uh, we're to, to rebuild our skills. As Joe mentioned, the, the standards that were built, you know, probably less than 10 years ago are now outdated. So it's an effort to um, really that we do this and also to capture the student's imagination is to partner with our customers and bring real life challenges to students. Um, and they get to work on, on real life data sets, uh, which is both interesting to them and of value to our customers because they now have a fresh set of eyes looking at this problem. So these are just some of the ways I know uh, 
we have a lot of questions, but um, just wanted to share that a little bit with you. Really cool. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I remember as an undergrad at Spelman College getting my first email. Right. So we, we've come a long <laughs> way about how we get data science education from different arenas. Dr. Loretta Bravo, you're the director of the first data science institute in Chile. You were also the first at the first university in Chile that has a diploma and master's in data science. So as director, how do you ensure that females in particular feel welcomed and encouraged to persist in data science in spite of not having many other female role models around them? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And um, well, it's a tough question. Uh, the truth is it's an ongoing effort. Um, most of our students are, in fact, male. And um, I think some of the valuable things that contribute to, to make women more comfortable or willing to pursue a career in data science is to have professors that are women. Uh, also, in our case, to have the director of the program to be a woman, <laughs> which is me. Uh, but I also think it's uh, it's good for them to be able to see women that are succeeding in jobs in data science. And in that sense, I think the event Women in Data Science is uh, it's an, an enormous help. Uh, I've been able to have the privilege to be able to both attend the event several times and also organize the event here in Santiago, Chile. And uh, it's amazing to see, uh, I don't know, the director of data science of Fitbit, we were just watching that uh, talk, uh, female. Uh, the director of data science in Netflix, Airbnb, and you start adding women that are just amazing. And uh, so encouraging the students to participate in this type of event uh, has also been shown to be like a very good way of showing what we can do uh, in data science. I love that reminder about always encouraging others and sometimes encouraging ourselves to really stay active and current in data science. Thank you. Um, Joe, we often see in the tech industries Horrible examples of exclusivity, where people of color and women are not invited. They're not invited to come to the um, STEM school, for example. How do you think that expanding the K-12 curriculum to incorporate data science will either carry on this exclusiveness or perhaps bring a new way to engage more into STEM? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that question, yes. I think one of our greatest barriers to kids going forward in STEM is mathematics. And for generations, we've really had one valued high level pathway, which is the pathway to calculus in the US. But calculus is the only course in the US where you have to be advanced in middle school to get there. And so for a long time, we've been pushing kids out of that pathway in sixth grade. And unfortunately, pushing kids out has been a lot of girls, a lot of students of color. So um, data science has now been approved as a high school course and can be taken instead of Algebra 2 in California. That's a huge development. And at UCubed, um, we're actually creating a high school course. Uh, we're making it with Google tools, a lot of free tools. And one of the things I'm most excited about is we are communicating that any high school student can take this course. You don't have to be advanced in middle school. So I really see it opening the doors of STEM to many more students. So many girls in particular have been really put off by that algebra, heavy algebra pathway. And data science, um, it's so much more engaging for kids. It's real data in, in their real lives. And, but it's not a low level pathway. It's just as rigorous, I don't love that word, but just as important as calculus. Mathematics is such a broad subject with so many different forms of mathematics. There's no reason that we should have only ever concentrated on calculus. So we see this data science in high school as be, having a really liberatory effect of 
many more girls going into it, many more students of color, and then staying in STEM. Instead of being put off by lots of procedures, they'll be pulled into this really exciting subject. Um, so at UCubed, we have developed not just a high school course, but also an online class to help teachers learn the content and lots of lessons from all the way up in the new California framework, we're really emphasizing data right from the kindergarten years where kids can learn what data is and start to be comfortable with it. So it's really an exciting new um, initiative that I think has implications for the whole of K-12. That does sound exciting. It's exciting to actually see multiple pathways for people to come into STEM. It doesn't have to be a narrow road. We can have more than one option. Thank you. Exactly. Oh, Karina, you're at this intersection of data science and the tech business in your role over university alliances. So with diverse teams, we can develop better solutions. But how do we make sure that the latest data science tools are accessible to everyone so that we really do cultivate diversity in data science? Thank you, Talitha. Um, before I get directly to that question, I do want to build on um, Joe's comments on how important it is to get younger students engaged. And I should have mentioned that SAP has a number of programs um, to inspire and um, really uh, support the building of digital skills of younger students. We have a Young Thinkers program I want to mention um, with coding. Um, there's a, a SNAP that is in collaboration with Berkeley to again inspire younger students to learn data science. And I think it's so important, as Joe mentioned, that data science really does open up the field um, to more girls of color because data science is something that affects every part of our lives and can be applied to say even like social justice issues, obviously that is of top of mind to a lot of people in this country. And they see the application and the implication, you know, of, um, of these algorithms and what can be done with data. So first I wanna mention that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a number of online courses that students can go directly to SAP to learn about. It's called Open SAP get a number of courses that they can do independently. Besides those, we have um, we make sure we work with over 2,300 schools globally. But again, here in the US, because our CEO has made a commitment to double um, the, the black workforce here in the US within the next three years, I am personally making sure that um, SAP tools and curriculum is being available at HBCUs, at Hispanic serving institutions, and schools across the country. Um, but I do want to mention that, that besides a curriculum in schools, we do have um, online resources that are available for folks and that we are very serious about getting really young students engaged in, in data science and just digital skills, digital literacy. Um, and we also have our, our corporate and social responsibility board, which one of, uh, one of the pillars of our corporate and uh, social responsibility is um, bridging the digital divide, because we know that this is an area that um, continues to grow this gap of, especially now with COVID and online instruction, um, those students that are um, less wealthy don't have access to some of the tools that other students have access to. And so um, making sure that we bridge this digital divide by um, ensuring that we have a healthy pipeline of students coming in. And so the more women we can attract, the more people of color, the better that um, we're gonna be. Every company recognizes that, you know, and understands and wants to build diverse teams. And we can't do that, you know, just at the college level because it's too late. We need to make sure that we have, again, a healthy pipeline of students, of diverse students uh, coming in, um, making sure that we don't lose them in middle school, as Joe mentioned, because um, the math skills, um, and again, it's very important I, we do want to build strong math skills, but I think it's important that they see the applications and that will definitely keep their interest, um, you know, to to pursue this field where, where they see how these skills can benefit and solve big societal problems. So I think that's where we want to make sure that we engage with students really on their level and at their interest. Um, as I mentioned, the Young Thinkers program, SNAP, they can use that for paintings, for music, and just um, fun they can have, honestly. 
Um, and nobody can argue with that, right? Like learning can be a lot of fun. So how do we fun? And again, um, personal, how do we make it personal, you know, that you can use these data sets to address a problem or an issue in your community, I think is very important. So I think I want to run a little bit, but. No, you took us, <laughs> took us all the way. That's great. Thank you. Roberto, you actively participate in international data science research teams. What diversity and challenges and opportunities do you see at this international level of conducting data science research? Well, it's, uh, it's becoming easier in the sense that, uh, well, the pandemic pushed us, uh, to, the pandemic pushed us uh, to move most of our things online. So now it's not so different, uh, the collaboration with someone that is in here in Santiago, Chile, to the collaboration with someone in Europe. And um, so, so I think uh, this also has to permeate or move to the areas of, um, of jobs, like projects in companies. Uh, and you can see that in data science, uh, that is becoming increasingly easily, easier. Uh, for example, you have uh, these international projects where you get people working from all over the world. Uh, imagine this event with people from all over the world at the same time. So uh, I think you can benefit from the diversity of different cultures. Uh, and you have at the same time the challenges of the different cultures, but at the same time you enrich what, you, what you're actually doing. So I think uh, it's actually a big challenge, but that it's absolutely worth it. Thank you. Yes, I agree. As a fellow director, yeah, I agree. Totally worth it. <laughs> Joe, let me take us back to California. You talked a little bit about equipping teachers to actually teach data science. And so our panels on diversity and data science education, how do we ensure that our teachers are equipped to handle some sensitive topics that could come into um, talking about data science. In particular, how do we equip our teachers to talk about ethics, to talk about bias in sensitive ways that could hit the home with students? I mean, we've seen predictive policing, facial recognitions, and how they could adversely impact uh, communities of color, in particular the Black community. So how do we help our teachers guide these sensitive conversations around data science that's linked mm -hmm. to these social constructs? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. It's so important. It's certainly something we're building into our own high school course that we're creating at UCubed. But one of the things I'm hopeful about is that it won't just be left to maths teachers to teach a data science course that in high schools, at least, different subject teachers will collaborate. It's such a cross-curricular subject. You bring in those humanities teachers who are thinking about the ways of communicating, as well as scientists and social scientists. But um, I would also love to have educators work with data scientists to keep these questions that you're really important questions you're asking, Talitha, really current as we're thinking of data science rolling out in schools. It's such an important moment. This is a new field. It cannot be rolled out in the way mathematics has been over the years. Such an exclusive subject that has kept so many people out. And not only in the way we have courses and the who teaches them and how we open them to all kids, we also have to think, as you say, about the content, about how we raise issues of bias and uh, bring in those really important social justice issues. So super important questions. I think we need to keep having these conversations with people like the people, amazing women on this panel and the people at the conference to make sure that as data science gets into the school system, it that those equity issues are taken really seriously. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, as a, as a mathematician, I, I have seen and worked with a lot of students that have had to unpack their emotions because of some traumatic experience that's linked to math. But you know that that's a, that's a part of why we're here to really help and guide others and bring them along their path wherever it may lead. So thank you. So Karina, 
imagine I'm a student. Well, okay, I'm a director. I do walk across, work across four HBCUs. So just imagine I, I am a student at a historically black college or university, and I want to really just do these SAP courses. They sound fun. They sound amazing. You're amazing. How can it be like you? Where do I start? Absolutely. So first, uh, we would welcome all of you who are interested in learning more about SAP. So we do have open SAP courses. Um, one of the things I'm looking to do is to make sure that faculty, again, at HBCUs and every every school across the country that is interested and across the globe, honestly, is well trained to teach our software. But short of that, like I mentioned, we do have open SAP, which has a number of courses listed um, in and, and so that's a start uh, if it's not being taught at your school. Um, so like I said, we are reaching out. Uh, we have a number, we have a program actually within SAP. So um, a shout out to Judith Williams, who's the Dr. Judith Williams, who's the head of um, diversity and inclusion at SAP. She has a program called Propel. Um, and the lead there is Danny um, Allen, who I'm working with closely. We have a number of schools that we are making sure, again, that they're equipped, that their faculty are trained. But like I said, as a student, if you're a student, you can definitely um, start at the Open SAP course. And then, of course, applying. We have amazing internship programs. Um, Germany, for many years, has had a vocational program where students, while you're in school, you can work part time at SAP where they switch. In fact, our CEO is a, a great example of that. He actually started working at SAP in college. And, um, and so we are now bringing this program to the US and we are partnering with a, a few schools at the moment as a pilot, but hoping to open it up. And as a sophomore, you can start um, an internship at SAP and rotate through different um, departments. Um, but again, I, I should also mention that we do have internship programs and not only, you know, as a head of university alliances, as I like to mention, I personally don't do recruiting, but, and of course, we'd love to have your, this great talent come work at SAP, but we also have a huge um, ecosystem, which just last week I was talking to someone in the higher ed group who, uh, another university who said, listen, we need SAP certified students. So that's something that students should know. Um, I have posted on my Twitter account um, the starting, sal starting salaries of um, SAP certification, which is uh, quite impressive for those students as they're coming out, um, especially in this environment that SAP certification can, can really um, secure you a, a, a nice salary. So I do want to put in that plug for that as well, since we all need to pay the rent and keep the lights on. Um, so yeah, to leave that with that, I would just say go start at Open SAP, please, and then um, make sure that your school has or is uh, adopting our curriculum as well. And internships are another great way again to get involved and in, um, yeah, work with us. That sounds great. Actually, I talked to Danny Allen earlier this afternoon, so he's amazing. <laughs> but I, I like the real having the multiple pathways. There's obviously you learn stuff in school and that's great, fun and dandy, but there's also certification programs where you can either reskill, upskill, learn a new skill that can really catapult you, catapult your career. And then there's also the internships, getting that practical uh, real world experience. So yeah, all of those are quite important. So thank you. Um, Loreto, as the director of this first data science institute in Chile, and and you female how when you ran into difficult times maybe you question yourself maybe not what did you do to overcome that to say i'm going to do this anyway i'm going to do this research i'm going to get this director i'm going to get this institute going so what did you tell yourself to remind yourself to keep moving forward when times got really hard and challenging well, it, it hasn't been easy. Uh, it's not only uh, that uh, it's I mean, it's Latin America too, so it's a more like a macho sort of culture. Um, and most of the environments in which I work, like I don't know, for example, the directors of my center are, are all male. Uh, so all the time, it's uh, very challenging to have the people around you. Uh, to sometimes have a different style of leadership. So 
um, I have people that work with me that have always been very supportive, and that's one thing that I believe is very important, the people that you surround with and also have some uh, mentors, people that, uh, women, that you feel comfortable with and that you can share your experiences. Um, and also, <laughs> I know that I said this already, but for me, women in data science, has been a great event, event in that sense. Like looking up to see the women that attend this event and that speak in this event has made me um, realize that I can do it. And also the stories they generally tell, like, you know, they thought they couldn't and they find a lot of obstacles and they went through them and finally succeeded. So, uh, I've had to learn so many things, like uh, last year with the pandemic, we developed an algorithm to measure mobility in, uh, in, the, in the whole country. And I ended up in TV, like all the time in TV. And uh, at the beginning, I've never done it before. Uh, but just believing uh, that you can do it and seeing that there are so many women out there doing it and succeeding, I think that's part of the of the, of the secret, or I don't know if it's a secret, but part of the, the reasons uh, that have motivated me to be able to continue. That's great. I love the enforcement reminder to surround yourself with that community, that you have, there's a soft place to land, but also people to encourage. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of you just to share your thoughts and reflection, taking us back to the video that um, came on before we were here. And they, she asked the question of what will data science education look like in the future and how will we mm -hmm. get there? So from your vantage point, how do you want data science education to look like as you move, move forward? Mm -hmm. What do we need to get there? Joe? I would say it's really important, and this is something we put through all of our work, that people have a growth mindset and they believe that they can learn anything, that they're flexible in their approach. Um, we're saying with our high school course, we don't care how well you've done in algebra and geometry, but come to it with flexibility and with open mindedness so you can take on new tools. It's less important really that kids are learning particular ways particular methods or particular tech tools, then they're learning flexibility and the willingness to learn new tools. That's so important for them going into the future. So I would say those are really high on my wish list. Great list. Karina? Yeah, I will double down on Joe's answer. Definitely a growth mindset is absolutely critical. You know, I get asked by students all the time, what should I study? Uh, you know, what's what what subject and I always tell them you have to learn to learn. That's where we are. Um, you know, the the days of lifelong employment uh, is very unlikely these days, uh, especially if you want an interesting career path. So I would say that uh, we really have to learn to learn. But I think, um, you know, down down the road, I see a lot of potential in very in personalized learning that we all can learn the same thing through different stories that resonate with us, you know? And so that's mm -hmm. really um, a key piece, I think, of, of future learning. That uh, one, you know, besides having a growth mindset, that you you learn through things that capture your interests. And again, are, you know, you get to, to basically pick the topic and then that lesson is embedded within that topic um, that you choose to study. So that's what I'm excited about. Awesome. In my case, when, when I think, when I think of um, the future of education and data science, like the two words that come out to me is international, international and with companies. I, I'd like to see programs that work with courses that are local, others that are international, that you might take a, a course with SAP, another with Coursera, and then start building over it, like very flexible on the way it's done, very international, but at the same time, ideally, in connection with data from companies or uh, foundations, but real world data. 
Um, we currently, in our program, we work with three companies that actually provide data for our projects, and uh, that has also been very, quite motivating for the students uh, to be able to work with real data. So, uh, yeah, for so international are very connected to companies. Yeah, that's great. Well, this has been a, a lovely panel and just to hearing all the perspectives that the panelists brings. Um, Dr. Bo Joe Boiler, Professor of Education at Stanford, thank you for bringing us into the K-12 space and, and giving us insight as to all the happenings that will be coming down. All the parents thought Common Core math was crazy. We didn't have a lot of <laughs> right. data. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. uh, Edmonds, VP, Head of Academics, University Alliances at SAP. Thank you for reminding us also that education doesn't happen only in the classroom. There's a lot of opportunities for credentials that could really boost the salary of students and also folks like me, old folks like me, who want to either reskill or upskill and that we just need to take advantage of those opportunities. So um, thank you, Dr. Edmonds and Dr. Loreto Bravo who's the Data Science Institute Director at Universidad de Desarrollo. So thank you for reminding us to have our support networks. The research is plentiful and what more fun could one have than working on real research with companies and industry. And with all of this technology, despite being a pandemic, we're able to really just close and come together and just have fun either creating data, le leveraging data, analyzing it, telling stories with data so that we can come up to real solutions in both the educational sphere that, that will lead to greater opportunities in diversity. So thank you all for a wonderful panel. It was a delight to be with you all.